Tonight, exclusive former President Gerald Ford, Reagan's death. As thousands of mourners continue to file past his flag-draped coffin at the Reagan Library in California, America's 38th president and his wife share their memories of America's 40th president. Next. Well, I was uh, in our house in uh, California at the time, and uh, the word got to me through one of my Secret Service agents. And uh, immediately upon learning that, Betty and I called uh, Nancy Reagan to extend our deepest uh, condolences and extend our prayers. Oh yes, uh, I saw him on occasion. Uh, uh, he and I uh, became very good friends. Uh, let me be very forthright. I think Ronald Reagan was a first-class president, and I treasured my relationship and association with him. I did. I went to his office in uh, Los Angeles one time after he had made that public announcement. He barely recognized me, but we had a chat for... 15 or 20 minutes, I tried to uh, bring things up that would refresh his memory. And we had a wonderful, very informal chat, but he was not the Ronald Reagan that I admired and uh, felt as a very good friend. It was a very sad announcement when we heard, uh, when he made the public announcement uh, that he had Alzheimer's. It shocked both Betty and me because he had been so much on the other side, aggressive, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, just a good guy. Well, I uh, look upon Ronald Reagan's career. Number one, he was a firm believer in the strength of the United States and as a nation that was going to be the leader of the free world. Secondly, uh, he firmly believed in the ideology that was uh, the prevailing point of view in the United States. He had firm views that I admired, I respected, and uh, he was a great statesman who we miss very badly. Well, we had a pretty good contest. <laughs> uh, it came out uh, where it, the final votes were cast in uh, Kansas City, and uh, I think I won by a narrow margin, but we became good friends despite, despite that contest. You know, uh, something I learned, uh, Larry, um, that uh, you have to, in politics, you have to uh, give and take and respect the views of others, and I certainly d felt that way toward uh, President Reagan. So you I didn't resent it. Uh, I had been in politics long enough, Larry, <laughs> that I uh, <laughs> uh, understood that in the political life, uh, you had to give some and accept some. So uh, I, uh, uh, that was a big, important battle between Governor Reagan and myself, but it turned out that we became very warm friends. And when he ran in 1980, I think it was, I mm. campaigned very hard for him all over the country. Well, let me give you the background on that story. Betty and I went to Detroit uh, before the convention. Then Governor Reagan and Nancy wanted to come up and say hello. And they came to the room, and in that room at the hotel in Detroit, he indicated he would like me to be his running mate. I said, uh, Governor, I uh, don't want it. 
let, let me think it over in deference to your request. Well, we negotiated back and forth, and it was very obvious that it was better for him to run as the candidate and let me campaign on his behalf, which I did. Everybody in this great auditorium tonight, we're all tremendously pleased and honored to have Ron Reagan and Nancy Reagan come down. We are all a part of this great Republican family that will give the leadership to the American people to win on November 2nd. I would like, I would be honored on your behalf to ask my good friend, Governor Reagan, to say a few words at this time. Mr. President, Mrs. Ford, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President to be. <laughs> the distinguished guests here and you ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to say fellow Republicans here, but to those who are watching from a distance, all those millions of Democrats and independents who I know are looking for a cause around which to rally and which I believe we can give them. On November 4th, if all of you here in our great state of Michigan and all of those wonderful people in 49 other states do as I am certain we will do, this country can start on a new road of, for the next four years with Ronald Reagan and George Bush. Well, the country had gone through some very difficult times. Agnew resigning, Nixon resigning, we had Watergate, we had the war in Vietnam. The country was going through a very difficult period. Ronald Reagan came in. He revised our and uplifted our spirits at a time that was so, so very essential for the future of America. I applaud it. I congratulate President Reagan. He did a heck of a good job. Well, that was uh, On behalf of the a sad event because I had gotten to know uh, President Sadat. He had, uh, and I had become good friends as we worked, negotiated to try and settle the problems of the Middle East. But to go from Washington to the Middle East, uh, that was about a 20-hour flight, as I recall, <laughs> with uh, the people that were there in close quarters. It was, uh, it, it was a pressure trip. Well, we talked about the tragedy of the assassination because I always felt, and I still do, that uh, Sadat and Rabin from Israel were a pair that I hope could make real progress in trying to settle and solve the uh, difficult challenges in the Middle East. So most of the time on the trip, all of us who were involved talked about what we could do to push the peace process forward. Mr. Gorbachev, open this gate. Mr. Gorbachev, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. 
two assassination attempts, <laughs> one by Squeaky Fromm in Sacramento, California, and again in, by Sarah Jane Moore in San Francisco. So I was a bit <laughs> familiar a with... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, I, I just couldn't believe why anybody uh, would undertake an assassination attempt at President Reagan. He has such an outgoing, warm personality. It was unbelievable that some crackpot would uh, take a shot at the president, who was a outgoing, friendly, uh, first-class individual. But I guess uh, these people who do attempt assassination are uh, unusual. Squeaky Fromm certainly was off her mind. Sarah Jane Moore the same way. So I guess Hinckley uh, would fall into mm. that same category. When it well, you can better ask Betty that question later <laughs> in the program. I think she was more worried than I. I wore a protective vest for a few weeks, uh, but uh, people said to me, well, why don't you stay in the White House and not go out uh, to meet the public. My answer to them was a president has to be aggressive, has to meet the people, and therefore I did. And uh, uh, good luck and thank God I had no <laughs> further incidents. I had good contact with him. Anytime I wanted to call him at the White House or elsewhere, the, the, I, he was available. And on more than one occasion, if he wanted to contact me, he did directly, and we would have a good conversation on whatever the subject was. We developed a very excellent relationship, and uh, it's a sad, sad event that he passed away, even though he had the tragic uh, disease of Alzheimer's. Oh, yes, and I... On behalf of Betty and myself, extend to Nancy our love, our gratitude. We treasure our friendship with her just as we did with Ron and Nancy together. I remember it very vividly, Larry, because when I was in the Congress, I was on the committee that made all the money available for our space program. And then, of course, when uh, President Reagan came up with the Star Wars program, oh, I was enthusiastic, and I was saddened by the tragedy in space. Well, nobody could do it better. He had a fantastic way of communicating <clears throat> He had a wonderful reputation as the great communicator, which he was. <laughs> so that speech on that occasion was a tearjerker. The crew of the Space Shuttle Challenger honored us for the manner in which they lived their lives. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning, as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of Earth to touch the face of God. Looking back, did I uh, asked both Nancy and uh, then Governor Reagan to come to the podium, which they did. And there's a great picture of Betty, and myself, and the Reagans on the podium after that particular uh, contest. I certainly do. Uh, I, um, you may remember, I had a short a very limited stroke uh, in 1990 and uh, but I remember the I remember the uh, speech by President Reagan and uh, even though I was hospitalized for about a week 
I uh, was enthusiastic about uh, the Republican chances. I have always believed in you and in what you could accomplish for yourselves and for others. And whatever else history may say about me when I'm gone, I hope it will record that I appealed to your best hopes, not your worst fears, to your confidence rather than your doubts. My dream is that you will travel the road ahead with Liberty's lamp guiding your steps and Opportunity's arm steadying your way. My fondest hope for each one of you, and especially for the young people here, privileged to be Americans have had a rendezvous with destiny since the moment in 1630 when John Winthrop, standing on the deck of the tiny Arbella off the coast of Massachusetts, told the little band of pilgrims, we shall be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us so that if we shall deal falsely with our God in this work we have undertaken and so cause him to withdraw his present help from us, we shall be made a story and a byword throughout the world. A troubled and afflicted mankind looks to us, pleading for us to keep our rendezvous with destiny, that we will uphold the principles of self-reliance, self-discipline, morality, and above all, responsible liberty for every individual, that we will become that shining city on a hill. That was a very outstanding characteristic of President Reagan. He always believed that things were going to be better, and he worked hard to make them better, to make the country, the United States, strong militarily, to make it strong enough so that the Soviet Union would collapse. He was an optimist, and he, he, he just lived optimism. Well, it was a key uh, time in our relationship, because when I was in the White House, when Lyndon Johnson, when others, uh, we were faced with the Soviet Union that wanted to uh, combat us directly. Uh, when President Reagan took over, he developed that friendship with Gorbachev that was helpful in the termination, the collapse of the Soviet Union. And I applaud President Reagan's role in making that possible. Well, the toughest spot, Larry, is that you, you have to be available 24 hours a day, every day of the year. And you never know when something is coming up that could meet, that could bring about a challenge to the United States at home and abroad. So um, you just have to expect the worst and always assume the best will take care of itself. That's exactly right, Larry, and I fortunately uh, didn't have any crises like that, although we had our share of problems. It's been a wonderful experience. Betty and I spent 28 years in Washington, 25 years in Congress, nine months as vice president, two and a half years as president. That was an exciting challenge and a wonderful experience. Uh, I was proud of the opportunity to be in Washington in those roles, and I thank the voters uh, for giving me that opportunity. Thank God uh, for this country where we have the kind of uh, opportunity for people to serve. I'm blessed and I'm grateful. Well. We have enjoyed uh, retirement. I've cut back on the speeches I make around the country. Betty and I spend more time together. 
uh, and uh, she was a wonderful wife while I was in the White House. Uh, we've had a wonderful relationship. We've been married 55 years, so I guess uh, we uh, can say things have gone pretty well. And before I'm fine. I had that setback in Philadelphia three or four years ago, but um, uh, I, I don't play 18 holes of golf anymore. I'm what they call a six-holer, but <laughs> I enjoy it, and uh, I have a bunch of pals in California that uh, are tough to compete with, but it's a wonderful retirement. Betty and I are very grateful. Well, I'll be 91 in about six weeks, so um, uh, it's moving up. <laughs> no, I don't think so. I've, I've, Larry, I've been to 14 Republican <laughs> conventions, so I think I've done my share. <laughs> I'll watch it on television and applaud our nominee and uh, the whole program. Tonight we come to this convention as simple volunteers. Betty and I are for Ronald Reagan and George Bush, and we are going to campaign for our Republican ticket from now until November 6th. Well, I'm darn glad that I'm on my feet. <laughs> uh, I will be 91 in July, and um, I applaud President Reagan for his many, many years of great leadership, and it was a great tragedy that he had uh, Alzheimer's for the last 10 years. I'm lucky so far that um, uh, I'm doing well, and Betty and I have a I'm good just President George H.W. Bush and Barbara Bush, exclusive next on... Well, I just heard of it to, on the, somebody came rushing in and said they'd heard on the news, so there was no inside information. And, uh, of course, made a profound impact on both Barb and me, because we love the man. In a sense, kind of a blessing, Mr. President. Oh, definitely. The battle is over, the victory won. I mean, he, he fought this thing and without a lot of cognizance, but uh, uh, I think everybody said, look, it's been a long, long time. Uh, it's been a terrible burden on loyal, wonderful Nancy. But life goes on, and, and uh, at 93, he's got so much that his life meant so much to so many people that I think, it, I think it, it's now a celebration rather than a sadness. And a two well, I think there was some thought, and then we said, look, after a week of mourning, a week of uh, great sadness, life goes on. Uh, and in this case, we've got five world leaders, former world leaders coming here. We've got 5,000 people. We've got a lot of planning that went into it. And so I think the final analysis, uh, the committee decided that it should go on. And I think that was the right decision. Points of Light plus the MD Anderson Cancer Center plus the George Bush uh, Library Foundation, which has our school and our museum there. But Larry, I, I got a problem. Uh, maybe you can help me with it. I, I get too emotional. I get too emotional if I'm speaking and eulogizing somebody I love. And in this instance, I felt very close to the president. So be emotional. Well, why not let it just right? want it. So I'll try. I'll rehearse it, and I'm working on it. Mine's very short. The president is giving the main address there. And uh, I was very flattered that Nancy wanted me to come and do this, but I'm going to try my hardest. Tell to what get Ronald Reagan it. told you. About Normandy. I said, Mr. President, how, how, did, how do you get through an emotional speech like that? He said, I wrote it down, and then I read it over and over again to myself, and out loud, but to myself. And he said, after a while, I'd get used to the words, and they'd, I'd know what they were, but I didn't, I didn't feel it uh, quite as much in my heart. But he was a master at that. Once in a while, he got emotional. He did a little bit on that, on that point to hop speech. But... Uh, he was, you know, he was superb communicator. And what was what tough, primaries? It was pretty tough. We had some differences, but we had a lot of things in common. But he blew me away pretty early, although we did carry some pretty good-sized states, Michigan, Pennsylvania, a few others. Uh, Iowa was good to me. But, but it became clear that, that the country wanted him, that our party wanted him. 
And uh, it was a marvelous moment when he called me at the hotel there and said he wanted me to be on his ticket because the common wisdom was that it was going to be uh, Gerald Ford. Do you remember Last that? Night. Well, that was How my break. How did he you? He just called up, picked up the telephone. He was on the phone. Yeah. And just a few minutes before that, I'd said to our son Jeb, now the governor of Florida, who was saying, Dad, this isn't fair, that you ought to get this. I said, nobody owes us a thing, Jeb. Uh, and it looks like it's going to be Gerald Ford. We're going to keep our heads high and go back to our life. And uh, The it, phone it, rang. The phone rang. That's it's right. amazing. Phone rang. And what did he simply say? He said, George, I've been thinking about this, and I'd like you to be my running mate or something like that. And he said something, well, can you support, I hope you can support the platform or something like that. I said, no problem. And it was a great experience, perhaps the greatest in a sense in my life, because it gave me real preparation uh, for what followed. History will say that. And a lot of it had to do, a lot of it had to do with accomplishments. Uh, the Reagan revolution, you might say, in terms of hammering home uh, the need for lower taxes. People forget that the highest rate, maybe not when he became president, but it was up around 90%. Uh, and Reagan articulated, President Reagan articulated the need to get taxes down, even though Larry had to compromise a time or two uh, on increasing. But it, it, his greatness stemmed from his adherence to principle. He, you knew where he was on the issue. He was not sticking a finger up in the wind to see which the poles were doing or which way the wind was blowing. And so he was great at that. But the side that I think I probably saw better than most Americans was this personal side. Tell me about American it. people understood it, but I saw it up close and personal because every Thursday, Thursday I'd have a lunch with him, or sometimes it was Wednesday, most were Thursday, uh, have lunch there. Uh, and uh, we'd talk, no agenda, no, no briefing papers. Uh, and... Uh, what I saw was a certain decency and a certain sense of honor and a great sense of humor. And it was, it was wonderful. Even when things were going tough, he'd tell me a joke or I, I would him. But it, it, it was that personal side of him that I hadn't known when I was uh, president, chairman of the Republican Party. Well, he, he did, and that was the great thing. He, I think I was one of a very few handf a handful of people that could just walk into his office. But yeah, we, I had certain assignments. I loved it when I went abroad for him. People say about, well, you know, they said about me going to the Soviet Union, you die, Bush will fly. Well, <laughs> the, the funny thing is I met Gorbachev for the first time and sent President Reagan a cable that I think today would hold up in my observation. But that was a wonderful assignment. There are many others, too, and I've had things that domestically. Uh, honor. It's a wonderful honor. I mean, when you fly in there. Well, I feel when I hear him say, flying into Bush, fasten your seat belt, you know, you get a personal charge out of all of that. The sad thing was... Well, oh, it wasn't very difficult because I vowed that when I was accepted for this job and then elected with him, that I would not deviate publicly from what he said. So it wasn't difficult because when I had a nuance of difference, I could talk to him like you and I are talking now, but without any cameras, and tell him what I thought. He never got angry or he never, uh, you know, said, wait just a minute, you're on the wrong track here. And I I always felt he welcomed uh, suggestions that might deviate a little or bit. He, wanted he did, and it, it, there weren't that many occasions. But at times there were some related to personnel in his administration that I might have a different view on, on uh, how they were treating him. <laughs> and in fact, this is totally inaccurate. Did you see it? In fact, yeah, I did. 
But I don't like to dwell on that kind of stuff. I remember, I remember distinctly President Reagan asking me if I'd talked to Don Regan about leaving, and I did. And uh, so I, I remember the intervening, but at his request. I wouldn't have done that without that. He hated it. That's why I said when, I, when there might be difference, nuances of difference, and they might be about personnel or something like that. But I would never go public with, with that. I mean, he was the president. I was a vice president, and uh, it, he, 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 I owed him my loyalty as well as my judgment. Was that hard, though? No. No? I have no personal agenda. It came later when I was running for president and when I was, uh, when I was president, but uh, no, it wasn't, it wasn't hard. It was a note <clears throat> on faith. I didn't know whether we were going to discuss it or not. But in his letter to the American people about this Alzheimer's, there was a couple of really nice, nice references that, that uh, I thought were pretty good. Uh, I'm now about to begin the journey into the sunset of my life for America. I know there will always be a bright dawn ahead. Another, when God calls me home, whenever that may be, I will leave with the greatest love for this country of ours. And then I just sketched out one, one more. Uh, he believed uh, that it came from somewhere, enjoyed the highest time. He quoted Jefferson often. And here's the quote, the God who gave us liberty, God who gave us life, gave us liberty as well. And then he spoke of the great, great beyond. So he had a strong faith. He wasn't always beating his chest about it, but he, he, he had a strong conviction that there was a hereafter I think there was one reference in here where he talked about the difference between communists, a Marxist state, uh, and, and the, a lot of the rest of the world, where they you believed should. in God and believed in hereafter. And you should. Almost four. So about 50 some years ago. Yeah. And you'll be, a little stone. you'll be buried together there. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. Is that. issue a U.S. initiative to change how business and politics are done in the region. Texas in Fort Worth we heard that he was shot. The Secret Service rushed me back out to the airplane, Air Force Two, uh, and as soon as we could, we headed back to uh, Washington. But it was a real shock. But you know something, Larry? I said it at the time. I'll repeat it here. I didn't think about the loneliest burden in the world, the, the job of the presidency falling on my shoulders. We didn't know enough about what, what was happening. I thought that a friend had been shot. I thought, I thought it would be... Uh, just a personal thing like that. And then, of course, as time went on and you had all the debate, it was running the country and landing where and there, it changed a little bit. But that was my first reaction. And that's what I'm trying to say about, about Ronald Reagan. You just felt, you felt a sense of friendship and closeness to the guy. We did. Barbara and I did. Went back, I wrote some yeah, I notes that are up there in my library, and I can't remember exactly what what they were, but it didn't dwell on it because we really didn't know uh, how serious, we get reports flying back, but none of them sounded like he was going to pass away, thank God, and there was no consideration given to transferring, that I know of, to transferring the powers of the president to the vice president. If that had happened, I would have, you know, felt more, well, what do I do now kind of thing, but it didn't, and I never tried to act like I was president, I sat in a regular chair, landed the helicopter up at the vice president's instead of the South Lawn, 
and just went about my business. My How job. soon? After? I don't remember. I don't, remember. I don't know that I saw him in the hospital. I, I, I don't I, think so. I think you. I, I think. I think they you, weren't encouraging visitors. I don't think Nancy. I wanted think you went flow. by the hospital and saw her and saw him. I'm saying I about the doctors. I was hope you're all Republicans. And I forgot to duck, honey. Things like that. And then one other wonderful incident where, where they found him on his hands and knees wiping up some water because he didn't want the nurse to get a, get disciplined for spilling. I mean, you know. That's, that was him, right? That's mm -hmm. wonderful. That's a classic stuff. example of him. Mm -hmm. That's right. He was in more walk by the guy running the elevator in the White House or the fella doing the ground, Irv, out there and the uh, groundskeepers and all that without saying, how's your family? How's it going? What's happening? I mean, he just had that way of, I call it kindness or decency. Did you ever think about assassination? Maybe, but not, you know, I guess I thought about it after, after I left the presidency and Saddam Hussein tried to knock us off, Barbara Mee and a whole bunch of others. But, uh, Didn't think about it while you were president? No. No, they'd brief us if there were any serious threats, and there are always threats on the president. But oddly enough, I think more about it now than... Yeah, I, do you think, you do think about it? Well, just once in a while, just because these Al-Qaeda people are nuts, and they'll do anything. But uh, I agree with Barbara what, about the Secret Service. We have total confidence in it, and the intelligence is good. I, we get some excellent intelligence that they work on. I think it was the, the dynamic for our whole country. We thought we were immune, protected by the Pacific, protected by the Atlantic, and suddenly this terror comes right home to... To our By the way, where were you? I was, uh, we spent the night in the White House that, that Sunday night. I think it was a Monday, wasn't it? And uh, was it we had taken We'd off. been at a cancer meeting on Monday, I think, and then... Then we were flying out when we heard about it, flying, we were going to Minnesota, and they grounded us in Milwaukee. A few hours later, the president called and said, where are you, Dad? He said, well, you made us land out here in some little town outside of Milwaukee. So it, but it changed everything, and, and it's... The country will be all right, though. The country will be all right. Reagan's optimism will prevail for the country even now. with your grace, the Reagan family, and especially Mrs. Nancy Reagan, who stood by him in memorable moments of history and never left him in the long moments of difficult performance when the wheel turned all so slowly. And he'd talk about it quietly and privately as well as publicly. Remember up in Reykjavik, he said, uh, told the troops, I gotta go home, Nancy's making dinner or something like that. Well, that's, you know, that was hyperbole, but it, it's what he, went, what he was about. And uh, it was a genuine love affair, and she set a huge example for the whole country in the way she has conducted herself over this long period of trouble. I'm out for some of it, he just wants to restrict the amount of federal funding that goes into certain lines or something like that. I don't really know much about it, but it, but uh, there may be a difference there, but not, not with me, but it, but I can see her, her anxiety about getting the federal government to do more. And I've been going through diaries and there's so many intimate moments and so many wonderful. You keep a diary? Not anymore. I did, but I did it too sketchily when I was vice president and president. But the ones w that interacted with the president was when I was vice president. And there are a lot of times when he was just so kind and wonderful that, that I, I think I was a friend, yeah. That's nice. In other words, that you could level with him on personal Definitely feelings. That. Definitely that. And I knew that he would not be, you know, unless he was kind of agreed, be out telling, here's what George thinks and he's wrong. I mean, behind my da back doing something or saying something like that. The minute I was on that ticket, the minute we were elected, 
he was uh, uh, totally friendly, or in my corner, you might say. You remember the Carter debate when he was debating Carter? And Carter said, well, your own vice president candidate down here called your economic voodoo economics. Reagan looked over at me and goes, <laughs> like this. You know? and then, he, then he gave him a great answer. I know. And great he just put me at ease so much. Instinct, right? His yeah. instincts oh, yeah. worked well for him. But its instinct was timing and communication, but it's an underlying decency, honor, kindness, humility, all of these things that are that from what, about which I learned so much. From Did that. you visit him all when he was ill? Yeah. Well, no, not when he was ill. We visited him after I left the presidency, and I guess it might have been in the early stages of the Did you send some of the early stages? Gerald yeah. Ford told us he did. Yes, we did. When, when, when I didn't when, I was, when, when he was president. No, I was in his side. You. Some people said then, uh, and I don't. I never, never detected a trace of it then. But yeah, the time we saw him, or maybe it was twice. I think I saw him twice. Uh, one of them was, it was quite clear that, that there were some disconnects. Was that hard to take? You're sitting with the, you're a former leader of the free world, he's a former leader of the free world, and he's not connecting. Yeah, it was. It was, it was uh, complicated sad. and sad. I saw him after he left office when I was president, and uh, those were very nice uh, occasions. I remember he went out to his library opening, and then we were the thing for Desert Storm, and so well, we'd see each other. We gave him the Medal of Freedom. I was there the day you gave him the Medal of Freedom. Came Nancy, there. And these were guest. wonderful occasions, but I don't remember, Larry, any disconnects in those years. So, George, I'm in your corner. I'm ready to volunteer. A, I'm ready to volunteer a little advice now and then and offer a pointer or two on strategy, if asked. I'll help keep the facts straight or just stand back and cheer. But, George, just one personal request. Go out there and win one for the Gipper. People, uh, Iraqi people should uh, should be part of uh, his, his his trial, um, and I think the trial should be a, a, a mixed trial of all the ethnic um, representation in Iraq. That Mr. Hossein should be given a fair trial. I think she, she, she should be given uh, due process. Um... The president. He wrote the thank you note. Like all kids, he opened early. <laughs> I always try to think of what you can do for a president. I used to go twice, I remember going to Al's Magic Shop. <laughs> and they had trying to Washington. find a couple of clean items I could pick up for the president. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and you'd take him there and he'd laugh and we'd had a lot of fun with that country. Larry, there was so much hand-wringing in the kind of conventional foreign policy establishment when he said something like, this is an evil empire. And when he said, tear down the wall, people, oh my God, this is going to cause World War III, you know, and, and all kinds of consternation. But, but the way in which he did it, you know where he stood, it was very powerful, very strong, but it wasn't uh, mean-spirited, and it wasn't trying to, you know, to, to stick a finger in the other leader's eyes, even though he said, Mr. Gorbachev, take down the wall. I think if you ask Gorbachev about that, he would rationalize and say, wait a minute, we could understand back then his feeling. So it was important, and he took on the foreign policy establishment, and emerged, I think, uh, with flying colors. That's in the right. beginning, you know, yeah, you just, you just didn't know. But I think, he, I think he ended up doing very, very well, even in Reykjavik, where they had to re reverse himself a little bit. But, but people said, look, he was trying for peace. He was trying to get rid of these nuclear weapons. He was trying to, you know, do something for world peace. And I think that is what came through, uh, even to those people who were wringing their hands in the beginning about the heat of his rhetoric. He's one of the best, Colin. It's just, of course, I'm, I'm so prejudiced. I'm well, not. I'm prejudiced because I just feel, again, a certain sense of friendship with him that's never going to be diminished. I mean, there's crisis here, crisis there, but hey, he's 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 a wonderful person, and he'll get tied into uh, President Reagan. I'm sure he will. Did Reagan have generally President Reagan a good team? 
I think so. I think at times he felt that it might have been stronger. But, you know, I, I think when he chose Jimmy Baker right at the beginning, who had opposed him, who had been my campaign manager, but he saw in Baker a uh, certain strength that I think the country really sees uh, ex post facto, that was broad gauge view. It didn't have to always be there. And the ca kitchen cabinet kind of guy, he said, this guy will help me, and he did. <laughs> <laughs> he just rolled off his back. And it's he, he just the way he'd do it. I mean, you know, hi, and come on. And he, he didn't like it. I mean, at times he felt he was, he was really hammered. Was Iran-Contra the toughest time? I think it probably was, Larry. And I don't, I think the speech he gave where he said, I told you I didn't trade head for, I still think I didn't, but this is the evidence and it looks like I may have or something. I mean, I think it, I think it, it, I don't ever remember it being totally down, but you could just tell it was a burden on him. How about Same thing. I remember I went over there, you mean when the Marine barracks? Yeah. I remember I went over there the day after that, kicked through the rubble at Lebanon. He wanted me to do that, and I was glad he did. But I think in that course of a conversation there, you could tell that it was hurting him. But it was, it was, uh, I don't think he worried about his own standing. I think what he's worried about is the loss of those young Marines. The worst part is sending somebody else's son or daughter into harm's way. I felt that way. I know the president feels that way, and I expect the pr President Reagan didn't have to do it as much, uh, felt that way, and I expect Jimmy Carter to. It's the toughest, no, no question. It's not even arguable what's tougher than that, because you can't pass the buck, can't form a committee, can't go to get Congress to pass them. You've got to say, I'm going to do this. And then, as a move I think it's probably going to take a little time to get that done, but I think it's, you know, I'd be all for it. I'll vote aye. Would you be for it? Put on bills. I guess I'm more, less political and more practical than you. I mean, they, they're going to want to put Martin Luther King. A lot of American heroes. Well, these are presidents, though. They're not going to... Well, I know. Uh, Hamilton wasn't president. Is he on one? Is that the <laughs> one you're talking about? $10 bill. That a boy. Thank Secretary you very much. Secretary of the Treasury. So, our differences about uh, domestic policy the one thing I liked about him was that he was not mean-spirited he was always optimistic about our country and he believed that freedom was a universal value his work is done and now a shining city awaits him may God bless Ronald Reagan that but not a lot it doesn't scare me it used to when I was a little kid Think about dying, I would be scared of that. Terrible, but when you get older, Larry, you, you know, you don't think about it a lot. I got too much to do, too much to live for, too, too, too much happiness to Does depart 80 from. Does 80 seem old? No, no, oddly enough, it doesn't. I, I, you think I'm probably, probably think I'm exaggerating, but it doesn't. And part of that is I'm blessed with good health, and I still want to do things. I still want to get out and do interesting stuff. They named an aircraft carrier for me. It's going to go to sea, it's christened earlier, it's going to go to sea in 2008, the George H.W. Bush CVN-77. I've got to be alive for that. I've got to go out on that, on that ship and relive my own days in the Navy. One, it feels good. It's exhilarating. It's like, why do I go 68 miles an hour in my boat, which I do when I go to go <laughs> fishing. I do. And it, there's a certain thrill in it when you're falling at 125 miles an hour and you're the one in control. It's not a tandem. It's a, just me and with a the guy there in case I mess up. But there's a thrill in it. And the second thing, Larry, is you asked how to, you know, about 80. I think it sends a message around the country, and I think it will around the world in this instance, that just because you're 80, that doesn't mean you can't do fun stuff or interesting things. You can, Boy, and I am. Cool. Looking forward to your birthday bash? Yeah, look, and we're thrilled you're coming, incidentally. It's an honor to be Very here. Very pleased. ceremonies at this. And it's going to be fun. Be, all the kids going to be there? Everybody? Yeah. Grandchildren? I, I think well, most of them. Not, uh, yeah. No, the twins are gone. They're overseas. The, the Anything President's you'd kids. want to say to Nancy? Like five minutes, ten minutes before. Oh, really? Yeah. Right before he died? Yeah. But I guess she knew it because she was, she said, well, you know, she made clear to us that he wasn't going to live. 
My message would be that the, what you've done is set an example for how to cope with grief, an example of standing by your, the God that loved you most, your husband. And uh, she did it, Larry. Decency. Yeah, all those personal attributes. Giving hope. He gave huge hope to this country. Yeah. Morning in America. We're the greatest. We're the best. Without putting anyone else down. The AWL patrol in our family. And I can do it when I'm happy. And if I'm saying something about someone I love and respect, I, I'm afraid the tears will flow. But I'm going to try to find something to dry them up. Yeah, I like it. I enjoyed seeing President Clinton at the World War II Memorial the other day. And... Uh, he was said, well, what were you talking about? I thought we were just friendly, you know, anecdotes. Well, just the thumb, but I got I, I just want to be sure it doesn't get injured Trust by me. a good warm handshake from you. When the